All right. Now, last week, we saw last week in, in Mark chapter 11 that on Sunday of the Passion Week, Jesus, Jesus entered Jerusalem, known commonly as Palm Sunday. Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a young donkey, as had been prophesied in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And he visits the temple complex, and it's late in the day. He just kind of goes and scopes it out. And then he returns to Bethany with his disciples. And then on Monday morning, the next day, he returns to Jerusalem with his disciples, and he curses the barren fig tree as an acted-out parable of judgment against faithless Israel for its refusal, to, its refusal to give him what he had a right to expect And then in keeping with that theme of judgment, he proceeds to the temple where he overturns the tables of the the money changers and he chases out the merchants. And when Jesus returns to the temple on the next day, that's Tuesday, when he returns there, he's confronted by the Jewish leaders who are demanding to know on what basis he did that. They want to know the authority under which he ejected people from the temple the day before. And when they refuse to answer his question about John the Baptist, he then refuses to answer their question. And then in in Mark 12, 1 to 12, Jesus tells them the parable of the wicked tenants. And he cites Psalm 118, 22, and 23 about the stone that the builders rejected becoming the capstone. And verse 12, it makes clear that the religious leaders You know, they weren't dense. They understood that he'd spoken about them. And for that reason, they're seeking a way to arrest him. You know, he comes, ejects people they want to know, and then he comes and tells them this parable of the wicked tenants, and they want to arrest him. But they're afraid to. They're afraid to arrest him because the people who are there, they believe that Jesus is a prophet. So the time's not right. They can't really quite do what they want to do, so they simply leave. And then in verses 13 to 17, you see here, see, since the crowd's perception of Jesus, that was an obstacle to their being able to carry out their plan. They wanted to arrest him, but they couldn't because they thought he was a prophet. So since their perception was an obstacle to the leaders doing uh, what they wanted, arresting him and ultimately killing him, they attempted to undermine that perception. So see, that's a problem for them, so they're going to take him down a few notches. And to do that, they send some Pharisees and Herodians to trap him. Now, as I noted when we were looking at chapter 3, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they're really strange bedfellows. Because the Herodians, they are people who are supporting the Herodian dynasty, and as such, they're pro roman And the Pharisees are anti-Roman. And yet they're willing to form common cause because Jesus threatens both of them. So even though they're really, uh, you wouldn't expect them to be working together, because both feel threatened by Jesus, they form an alliance to help one another. And the Pharisees and the Herodians, they pretend they're coming to Jesus because they respect his knowledge and his integrity as a teacher. You see, that's their approach to him. They're, they act like that. Well, that's, you know, we're just looking for a good man. You know, somebody who'll really just tell it like it is. See, somebody who'll give us a straight answer and who'll tell it like it is regardless of the consequences. A man of real integrity. And they pretend that's why they're coming. The reality is that they're trying to damage him in the eyes of the people. That's what they're really about. And they ask him, is it lawful? to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Yes, no question. So what are you going to do? Which, which way are you going to go? Yes or no? That's what we want to know. Now the tax that they have in mind, it's probably the Roman poll tax or head tax. And when that tax was first instituted in A.D. 6, It sparked a revolt that was led by a man named Judas the Galilean, and that revolt was violently crushed by the Romans. And this episode is referred to 
in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, Judas claimed that it was an act of unfaithfulness to God to pay taxes to Rome. That was his position. That's what he claimed. It was an act of unfaithfulness to God to pay taxes to Rome. As Mark Strauss remarks, he says, the dilemma, see they're putting on, give us a yes or a no. And the dilemma is that if Jesus answers yes, he will anger the people who despise Roman oppression and taxes. See, so they're trying that then they will alienate him from people. They will think less of him. Then he says, but if he says no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Rome. He says he's guilty of sedition and liable to arrest and crucifixion. Now, Jesus knows they're hypocrites. See, he knows that their true intention is to trap him. And he lets them know he knows. By asking him, he says, why put me to the test? You see, they come up here thinking, we're going to get over on the Lord. Oh, teacher, you're so great and so you have such integrity and all of this. And Jesus says, why do you put me to the test? You see, he, he knows exactly what they're doing. He lets them know that he knows. And he then tells them to bring him a denarius. And a denarius was the coin that was used to pay the Roman poll tax. And it bore the image of the emperor on it. And it had an inscription on it identifying the emperor. So when Jesus asked whose image and inscription is on the coin, they correctly answered Caesar's. That's whose image and whose inscription is on this denarius that is used to pay this poll tax. And Jesus tells them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You see, he means it's proper to give Caesar back his coins, to pay taxes but one must give God his due, meaning one's heart and ultimate allegiance. That's what God is owed. One's heart and ultimate allegiance. In other words, paying taxes is not inherently an act of disloyalty against God. One can pay a ruling power without surrendering allegiance to God, just as one can pay people for other services without surrendering allegiance to God. When you pay something for something else, you don't consider that, well, by doing that, I am surrendering my allegiance. No, you don't do that. So there is room to pay somebody something without surrendering allegiance to God. And that's what Jesus that's what Jesus is telling him. And in making that distinction, you see, he splits the dilemma that they think they have him trapped in. Yes, no, he goes either way, and it's bad for him. Well, he winds up splitting that dilemma. He undermined the religious objection to paying taxes without denying that one's ultimate allegiance is owed to God. You see, and you see this, of course, reflected later in the New Testament. For example, in Romans chapter 13, 1 to 7, this idea of paying taxes. And less specifically, in 1 Peter 2, 13, 17. And his opponents are just blown away. You see, they marveled at him. They're just, they marveled at him because they were certain that they had him. It's like they got this trap set. And they come up here and they're certain they've got him. And they set the trap. What's it going to be? People around. And Jesus answers him, he says, you give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but you always give to God ultimate allegiance. You see, you give him what he's due. And they're just blown away. And so they marvel at it, and what it says here, they, uh, they, they're certain they had him, and he, he escapes the trap, and so they just, they're saying, you know, and, and they marveled at him because they thought they had him, and it turns out they didn't. Then in verses 18 to 27, the Sadducees, now they're going to take a run at him. Now the Sadducees, they are a pro-Roman sect of first century Judaism, uh, and, and they were associated with the priestly aristocracy, the high priesthood, and the temple leadership. They controlled the Sanhedrin. And they were the main competitors of the Pharisees. 
Now, the Sadducees, they denied the common, dominant Jewish view that there would be a resurrection on the last day when God judged and remade the world. Pharisees, most Jews, that was their understanding. But the Sadducees, they denied that. They denied that aspect, denied that there would be that resurrection. They also accepted only the Pentateuch as Scripture. In other words, only the first five books of the law. That was the only one they, they took as Scripture. And they denied that there was any authority in the oral traditions. Now, this is the only time that they're mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. And they take their turn by giving Jesus a hypothetical. And this hypothetical is designed to make belief in the resurrection look foolish. You see, that's what, they're, that's what they're up to. The hypothetical is a woman who, by virtue of six leveret marriages, had seven legitimate husbands during her lifetime. You know what a leveret marriage is? Well, under the Old Testament, you have a husband and wife. Husband dies, no children. Then his brother is to come and provide children for his estate. And so in the hypothetical, this happened six times. He's there, and then you follow that with six leveret marriages. None of them have kids. And so she's had seven legitimate husbands during her lifetime, and the punchline is in verse 23. This is where they think they have. It says, in the resurrection, when they rise again. You see, when people return to bodily life, in the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Hmm? How about that? Jesus? Whose wife will she be? And the contention is that belief in the resurrection, you see, is absurd because when it comes to renewing in the resurrection the earthly relationship of marriage, which would have been severed by death, as Paul says in Romans 7, 1 to 3, but they thought, there were, there were people who thought, look, in the resurrection, these certain earthly relationships will be renewed. And so their beef is, they said, look, given that these earthly relationships, this earthly relationship of marriage will be renewed in the resurrection, there's no principled way to distinguish between her seven legitimate husbands. So in the resurrection, who's going to be her husband? Which marriage is going to be renewed? There's no, they're all legitimate husbands. So what's the deal? Doesn't that show you that that's silly? And Jesus tells them that they've been led astray because they don't know the Scriptures or the power of God. And as for their not knowing the power of God, he says they don't realize that resurrection life is not going to be merely a continuation of present earthly life. Rather, it's going to be a new kind of immortal, glorified existence. Life in a heavenized creation. Life in the new heaven and new earth. And in that state, there will be no marrying. There will be no renewal of prior earthly marriages. There will be neither death nor procreation. Resurrected saints will be like angels in heaven in that they will not die and will not marry. So he says, you don't understand the power of God. You don't understand what is going to be at work in the transformation of fallen creation. You're looking at it like the idea is it's just going to be a continuation. No, it's not. It's going to be a radical makeover, a radical renewal. So you don't understand the power of God. You see, and as for their not knowing the Scriptures, he points out that even within the Pentateuch, even within the five books that they accept as authoritative, specifically in the episode of Moses in the burning bush, and the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, resurrections implied. You see, it's implied there by the fact that God continues in a covenant relationship 
with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob after their deaths. He remains their God, which wouldn't be the case if death meant non-existence. See, if death simply went, meant you went out of existence, then there would be no relationship that would be retained. So rather than, if it meant non-existence, rather they're continuing life and their existence in a different form, there wouldn't be that ongoing relationship. But they do continue. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob do continue to live. But they simply continue to live in a different form. Now the fact he remains their God implies that because he in his faith implies resurrection because he in his faithfulness he will not let people remain in death forever he won't let his people remain in death forever a state that is a consequence of sin it is a disembodied state that is less than the fullest possible life for them it is not fullness and wholeness of life. It is death and separation of the non-material aspect of the person. But he won't let them remain that way. They are still in covenant relationship. And because he's faithful, he will restore them to life. So he's saying, look, even in the text that you acknowledge, resurrection is implied. And so he says, you don't know the power of God and you don't know the scriptures. You see... They'll be raised from the dead. He says they're badly mistaken to think otherwise. So here they come and they think they're going to trap him and that doesn't work out for them. And then in 28 to 34, one of the, one of the scribes. Now Mark doesn't tell us his particular affiliation, but we know from Matthew 22, 34 that he was a Pharisee. One of the scribes saw that Jesus had rebuffed the Pharisees or the, had rebuffed the Sadducees' attempt to deny the resurrection, and he was happy about that. Because the Pharisees, like most Jews, they believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees were odd man out. And here comes this Sadducee trying to make belief in the resurrection look foolish. Jesus shuts him down. So this guy's happy. He you know, right on. You know, amen to that, well done. So he believes in the resurrection, believes that Jesus had responded well to the Sadducees' claim. Now Mark doesn't specify the scribe's motivation for questioning Jesus, but we know from Matthew twenty-two thirty-five that he intended his question as a test. See, something he thought might reveal some weakness in Jesus as a teacher or might alienate some who currently were enthralled by him. So he intends this as a test and he asks, which commandment is the most important of all? You see, all these guys taking runs at Jesus, they think, look, I can make him look bad. I can do something to him. So, Lord, you know, this is one of these issues people talk about. Which commandment is the greatest one? And Jesus answers by referring to Deuteronomy Chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which is part of what's known as the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And the Shema was a statement that pious Jews recited twice each day. And he says, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, the first part there, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, that's not a command, but that affirms that the God of Israel is the one and only God. The God of Israel is the one and only God. This was Israel's monotheistic creed that they recited all the time. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, you might remember that Paul creatively Christianizes this confession. He Christianizes this confession by having the synonymous terms in the confession where it says, the Lord our God is Lord. You see, when he says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Lord, God, Lord. Well, those are synonymous terms. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, he Christianizes that in a really neat way 
that confession by having Lord and God refer to Jesus and the Father. And he does it without skipping a beat as though somehow that threatened his monotheistic commitments. It didn't. It didn't. But Jesus tells them, look, this is, this is the greatest one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is a command. That's a command for undivided loyalty and devotion to God. That's really it. That's the greatest, undivided loyalty and devotion to God. As Mark Strauss comments, he says, these four terms of the God, heart, soul, mind, and strength, he says these four terms represent separate components of human life but function as a kind of hendaya tetris, bizarre word, you've heard of the word hendiades, Okay, that's more common where you have two words that function to convey one idea. Okay, so this is a Hendaya Tetris where he's saying there are four words, but they function to convey this one idea meaning all you are and do. You see, that's, that's where faith is. It's about this idea of God being the one to whom we give ultimate devotion. You see, undivided loyalty. He is what motivates us. He is what drives us. The greatest commandment is that God is to be the central focus of your life. That is the greatest commandment. God, and it's not your job, it's not your family, it's not anything else. Now, all of those things... Making God the central focus of your life has has ramifications for all of those things. But your central focus is God. Your central focus in life. Everything in your life is to be ordered around that reality. That is the pole star. Everything's ordered around that. And that's what Jesus is saying. Now, related to this is the second commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, as Strauss says, those who truly love God will also love those who are created in his image. Now, whatever this scribe's initial motives were, when he came to Jesus and threw out this question, he's impressed by Jesus' teaching. And he acknowledges its correctness. He repeats it approvingly. And whereas Jesus said there's no commandment greater than these two, the scribe expresses his agreement with that point by saying they're more important than the commandments related to the offerings and sacrifices. See, that's just his way of saying there's there's no commandment greater. He's expressing his agreement with that. And those, those offerings and sacrifices would have been all around them in the temple. You see, they would have been able to see all of this stuff going on, these offering and sacrifices. Heartfelt allegiance to God. Inner devotion to God. Surrendered Him, that is paramount. That is paramount. And this is obvious from the Old Testament's repeated insistence. That God despises the worship of hypocrites. The empty offering of rituals by the rebellious. We sometimes treat the Old Testament as though, no, no. All God cared about in the Old Testament was just form and function. You just do the... That's nonsense. Just absolute nonsense. God has always cared about the heart of the worshiper. He's always wanted the person's heart and soul. Okay, so this is, this is what, and this is something that's absolutely paramount. You can see in there this idea of this, this despising the worship of hypocrites as though people live in rebellion to God. I don't care what you want. You're a joke. I'm going to live the way I want. I want to get stoned. I want to get drunk. I want to look at porno. I want to live with my girlfriend. I want to do X, Y, Z, and you go on. I don't care what you want. I'm going to live the way I want. But I'm going to come and expect you to be satisfied with trinkets of devotion. 
I will come and sing a song. I will come and do this. But I'm running my life. You got that? Now, what do you think God does with that? We don't have to speculate. It's all over the Bible. You can't treat God like that and think that God respects that or wants that. It makes him vomit. He wants you. Your surrender and submission, that's the predicate for any authentic and pleasing worship. Okay? And so Jesus is saying, listen, this is, this is how. Now because the scribe answered wisely, Jesus tells him, he says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. See, he, he's moving on the right track. And he's close to entering the kingdom of God because he's willing to recognize Jesus, the kingdom bringer, as a teacher of truth. He's willing to recognize Jesus as a teacher of truth. He's not so fixed in his skepticism to be blind. You've seen people like that. Maybe you've been somebody like that. Well, who's so fixed in his skepticism, as David Wood would say, he's got his skeptometer just dialed up to 99. Anything you say, it's not going to matter at all. This guy's not like that. He's willing to recognize Jesus as a teacher of truth. He's not blind, but he's open to seeing Jesus for who he is. And that's more than half the battle. When you begin to open to seeing the possibility, when you begin to say, let me see if this is possibly true. Instead of, I know it's stupid, I know it's not, I know it's not, I don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it. When you turn and say, I want to know, is this possibly true? You've turned a corner. You've turned a corner when you do that. And the Lord will let you know. He will let you know. Now, having shown up the Sadducees and won over this Pharisee, Nobody else dared to ask him any questions. See, they realized that this really wasn't helping their cause of undermining him. They keep coming and throwing stuff at him, and every time, figuratively speaking, he hands them their teeth. And so they realized this really isn't working out for us. So we better just bail on that. Now, in 35 to 37 of chapter 12, when teaching in the temple, Jesus challenges the scribe's assumption about the identity of the Messiah. They say, look, they say the Messiah is the son of David, meaning that he's simply a physical descendant. Whereas David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, he referred to the Messiah in Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, as his Lord. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, given that a physical father had greater status than the son, Jesus asked how the Messiah could be both David's son and David's Lord. What do you think David's talking about when by the Holy Spirit he says this? And the implied answer is that despite being David's descendant, his legal descendant, Jesus has greater status than David because he is in a special or unique sense the Son of God. You see, there could be Israelite kings who were called a Son of God because they were God's anointed and they were chosen and used for God's purpose. But he's saying that I am Son of God in a unique sense. And that's just what Mark said at the beginning of his gospel in chapter 1, verse 1, Son of God. He means Son of God in this special or unique sense. The Messiah is no ordinary descendant of David, a fact that the scribes had apparently missed or had downplayed. And the great throng of people in the temple, that throng was, at least for now, they were just loving it. You see, you can, can't you picture that? I mean, here is this controversial outsider in the lion's den and doing more than holding his own 
against those who claim to have all the spiritual answers. You can just see the people loving it. Because all of these people, the questions they may have had, and these people just insisting, we're the guys we know, shut up, we know, who are you, you're rabble. Uh, and then here's Jesus, and he's just giving it to them. And so the crowd is at that point, they're simply loving it. And then Jesus says in 38 to 40, he warns them about certain scribes. You see, not all scribes would be this way. You know how humans are. You have a range of people. But he warns them about certain scribes, those who crave emblems of status as religious leaders. He warns them about those kinds of people. See, that indicates, as we might say, they have a spiritual screw loose. It indicates they've got something wrong with them. They're prideful and they're inwardly corrupt that they crave these emblems of religious status. That's not a good sign. That's indicative of something gone awry that they are like that. And he includes in the warning those scribes who, he says, devour widows' houses. See, those who somehow are depleting the widow's assets, whether it's just sponging off them. You know, when you're, you're a big-time religious guy and everyone looks up to you and they think you're pious and somehow if I, you know, get in you that I'll get some of that glow off on me, it puts you in a position to exploit people. And you see this maybe more in the modern context of sexual exploitation where religious people use their position where people come to them trusting them, thinking this guy's pious well, they were doing this with, with the widows. And whether it was simply in their sponging off the widows or whether it was because the widows had made them guardians of their property, trusting them, and they were then skimming off it. But whatever it was, he adds that to it about those who devour widows' houses. Now, Scripture, of course, is full of commands to care for widows and fatherless children. To care for orphans and not to exploit them. And that's as religious leaders, that's what he says here, they will receive the greater condemnation as religious leaders. They receive an even greater punishment for violating those duties. The Lord cares about widows. He cares about orphans. He cares about the powerless. All right, so now we, we go to uh, in 41 to 44. Now here's Jesus is sitting across from the offering receptacle in the court of women. I'm going to talk a little bit, show you a little bit more where that is in a second. But that's the first inner court of the temple inside the court of the Gentiles. And this receptacle is probably a trumpet-shaped item that in the mission was called the, a shofar chest. But I wanted to take just a minute here to say a little bit about the temple mount just because... I think it's cool, <laughs> and I think it might help you to visualize some things. But you know that King Solomon, you had the tabernacle in the wilderness, then King Solomon, in the middle of the 10th century, he built the first temple in Jerusalem. And that temple was then destroyed by the Babylonians in 587, 586, when they completed their conquest of Judah. They had taken some people out in 605, that was Daniel. They'd taken some more out in 597, that was Ezekiel. And they come back in 587, 586, and they destroy the place and cart off some more people into Babylonian captivity. And after Cyrus the Persian conquered the Babylonians in 539 B.C., Zerubbabel and a group of Israelites, they returned to Jerusalem and they laid the foundation of the second temple around 536 B.C. But they stalled. And the temple wasn't actually built until 516 B.C. So there was a 20-year gap. And you may recall this is when Haggai and Zechariah, those minor prophets, were preaching to them about we need to get on with this and encouraging them that way. Well, so that's, so 516, that second temple is built. Now, in 20 or 19 B.C., okay, so we're from 516, quite a few centuries down the road. In 20 or 19 B.C., 
Herod the Great. Herod announced a plan to renovate the temple, which began the next year with his assembling the building materials. That task alone took eight years. And the reason he did that was is that the people did not believe he would, when he was renovating the temple and had it deconstructed, they didn't think he would actually go through with it and rebuild it. So to assure them, he said, I will collect all the building materials in advance. And you're talking about an awful lot of building material. This was a massive project. A massive project that transformed the temple area into what at that time was the largest man-made structure on earth. And here is a picture of that temple mount that was created. This was the complex that was known to Jesus and those of the first century. Now much of the work was completed by Herod's death, which is conventionally dated 4 B.C., although some people argue 2 B.C. But much of the work was done by that, the real guts of the job. But construction continued. It was a construction site until A.D. 63, only to be destroyed seven years later. Okay, but it continued. So it's not exactly clear everything that was present at the time of Jesus because they were still tweaking and modifying and adding and doing stuff. But the, the, the main parts were done within the first 15 years or so. Now Herod greatly extended the platform on which the temple was built, increasing the area of that platform to about 36 acres. Now that's a big platform. It's about 36 acres he did that. Now the platform, it's really the roof. If you see the temple, the main temple area here, here is the temple proper, and then you have the courtyards right around, immediately around here. This temple area, it's really on a mountain peak. And what you see is the platform, it's on Mount Moriah, and the platform is really hanging floors that come out and make this level. And you say, well, how do you do that? How they did it was they constructed along the sides of this mountain multi-level, multi-stories of vaults and arches so that what that is, it's really the ceiling that forms the floor of that platform. And you can see a cutaway of this over here. Here's the temple mount. You see there's the complex there. And under here on the mountain, you see these multi-story levels of these arches and vaults. And that's what they did. And they know that. For, they know how this is from rabbinic tunnels, they're called. So we can go under there and you can see these things. So now the foundational stones, the foundational stones all around here, you see, uh, uh, that are holding up the, that, that wall, those foundational stones of, the, of that retaining wall. See the retaining wall of this platform? These stones down here are huge. They're absolutely huge. They found one that's 46 feet long, 10 feet wide, and it weighs 415 tons. Now that's one stone. These things are absolutely huge. Now, parts of the western wall of this platform, see this thing faces east, so parts of this western wall of that platform are still there. And that's what you know as the wailing wall. You see, you sometimes see over in Israel, you'll see people over there in videos there. And archaeological excavations just on the perimeter indicate that this platform was somewhat irregular, something like a trapezoid instead of being a pure rectangle or anything like that. Now, once ascending to the platform, so you start down here and you come up, and once you ascend to the platform, you then come out on here and there is a wall. You see this wall that goes around the temple complex? There is a wall with gates, and you can go through there, and that brings you into the court of the Gentiles. That's this area here. Now, as you continue to proceed toward the temple proper and the immediately surrounding courts, 
there is a wall here, or really it's, it's, uh, it, it's like, uh, you know, the median, those big blocks that you have at the median. There is this retaining wall, not a retaining wall, but a wall that has gaps in it. And this is where, beyond which the Gentiles can't go. So this marks off the area where they can't go beyond it. And there are warning signs posted all along this that Gentiles entering beyond this point are subject to death. So then you come in here, and then you, you walk, and then there are steps up here, and then here is the complex proper, and here is the court of the women and the treasury. And then I can show you this better in the next slide. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide is a bird's eye view of just this area. And so here you'll see, like here is the court of the, court of the women and the treasury, which is where Jesus is when he sees the, the woman putting the money in there. And then you go in here, and then here is this very narrow, this is the court of the Israelites. And this is a court where only clean Jewish males could enter. And then beyond this, there is something called the court or the hall of the priests. Now, at least one source describes that quarter hall as likewise narrow, just like you see the court of the Israelites is narrow. But certainly the priests are ministering and working all in here, so perhaps this narrow court was for priests who weren't actively on duty. Uh, I don't know. But you, certainly they're ministering in here, and you have, you have the people in there. Then as you move west, so here's the, the woman's court, court of the Israelites, hall or court of the priests, and then here's where the ministry takes place. And of course, this is the temple proper, where you have the holy place and the most holy place. So this is the, this is the temple that we're talking about where Jesus is. And so Jesus, he, he winds up, he, he serves there. I've got to get situated here because I had to... There we go. He serves there, and I got a note here to mention Abra, but I already mentioned Abra. So <laughs> remember, look in the bulletin. All right, now, we're, uh, I know the bell's going to ring here in a second, but did I say a second? All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. Uh, we'll see. Thanks for coming.